Welcome to the Wizards of Ecom, your no fluff playbook for online success. Each episode is fully packed with actionable tactics you can implement in your business right now. Take your life to a higher level and excel in your online success. It's time to work on you and your business. Let's do this. Hi everyone, welcome back to Wizards of Ecom. This is your host, Noemi, and today I'm joined by none other than Steve Simonson, Analytic Director of Simul Global, founder of Empowering, or Simony and Catalyst 88, host of the Awesomers podcast, a serial entrepreneur who founded, purchased, built, and sold several companies over the three past decades. Steve, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm glad to be here. And uh, wow, you must be exhausted after that intro. Yeah, I forget how old I am, but yeah, I've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> and this was not even all the stuff that you've been doing. These are the highlights of it. So thank you Good so enough. much for yeah, thank you so, so much for being on the show and why I love and appreciate you so much for being on the show. As you were saying, you've done so, so much, yet you're still a regular, like a super regular people who is like able to talk to like to anyone, you know, and share their knowledge. And I appreciate that always when I see someone who's super successful and achieved in life and still like they can talk to you. So I appreciate that once again. Well, I'm glad to be here. I can tell you, I failed more times than your average listener. So, uh, you know, I've had some wins, but I believe me, I've got some losses too. So uh, it's not all uh, just, you know, success. Uh, that It comes after a long series of failures. So don't let the uh, resume fool you. I got plenty I learned the hard way. That's, that's brilliant. I love that you put it that way. Most of the time people will see only the best things, you know, and they will think, Why, when will I become Steve? And Steve just proved it that this is how you become someone. Really like failing regularly, so I appreciate that sharing. All right, so Steve, the reason I wanted to have you on the show today is uh, because you gave a brilliant presentation around two weeks ago, like in-person presentation to our group, and mainly it was about the current supply chain issues that are happening in China, and you gave a very, very brilliant, like behind the scene or behind the curtains insights of what's happening. I don't really can say that anyone would have described the issue this way because you went like through the deep meaning of things, which is demographics and understanding everything what's happening, not for like, this is what happened and, you know, like it happened, you know, but really making us understand, hey, this is what's happening and you should be very careful what to do next. So that's the topic that I would like to talk about today because uh, I think it's super, super important. First off, China is our main source still, you know, when it comes to manufacturing, everyone who's taking, of course, everyone who's like, it doesn't depend which level you are, you're going to China or Alibaba or so on. And uh, today's topic is going to be about like, first off, what is causing the supply chain to be broken in this scenario? And what can your regular Joe, the seller do in order to really cope with it? So um, yeah, the first question would be like, what do you see that it's basically the cause of what we experience at this moment? Well, the, the first thing, I think most of what we see are symptoms of the problem. So they're, they're not the causation of the problem, but they're the symptoms. So when you hear about, you know, I remember a few weeks ago, we were, everybody's jumping up and down going, oh, there's 74 ships in the port of uh, Los Angeles, Long Beach area, right? This was the, the record. And, and now there's like 163 ships by there uh, in, in that same port area, by the way. So it, it hasn't gotten better. It's gotten worse. And that is a symptom of the problem of, uh, that happens to be a domestic supply chain logjam, often uh, caused by COVID, right? Some works um, uh, has been taken offline. Some of it is caused by increased in uh, domestic orders. So the, unfortunately, there's no simple answers. But I can say, you know, when you think of causation, COVID got the ball rolling. And then some of these other factors uh, that include things like supply chain being too fragile, um, people raising their prices and inflationary pressures, sometimes making things more or less profitable. And then just uh, pure capacity problems exist. And, and this goes into labor shortages and why do they, you know, why are those happening? And is it because people were getting their stimmy money during the, the uh, COVID lockdowns? And, and there's many questions that, that deserve answers, but there's no simple thing to go, oh, well, uh, you know, Bob uh, clicked the, the left mouse button and now we're all screwed, right? It's, there is nothing simple about it. But I can tell you, because of that, when you see politicians on the TV declaring that they're going to solve this or they're going to do something, uh, all of that is just ego nonsense. They, they, nobody can solve this just simply by 
you know, cracking their fingers or snapping their fingers, I should say, uh, in the same way that nobody can solve COVID by simply going, we're going to we're going to fight this thing. Right. These are wild, um, you know, situations that are beyond our individual control. That's that's fundamentally the point. So all we can do then as the as a typical seller is just our best. Right. We just do our best. So we, we get multiple quotes for freight. We we really are realistic about our profit margins. We do the math about our profitability. We don't accept kind of the status quo. We have to start being dynamic and we have to think. And critical thinking is, I believe, underrated and frankly, underused in our society these days. I mean, I'm talking about all of Western society, commercialized society. Use your brain, for God's sake, right? Think about profit. Think about timing. Does it make sense? And, and some things that made sense 12 or 24 months ago don't make sense today. So we have to start, you know, arranging that critical thinking, not just about what to do today, but also the future. I love it. And I love that you pointed out critical thinking. You know, I never cease to see like the good in people, yet critical thinking is something that like 99% of people don't have. So how to develop that critical thinking in this scenario, understanding that, let's say, you are a new seller, just took a course, just understand, and you want to start and you're passionate about them, then someone is coming, hey, that's not working anymore. So how would you develop that sense? Well, the first thing is you have to start at context matters. So I always begin with context. In this particular case, you've said the context is a new seller. Presumably yep. they don't have an item and they want to source something and, and get going. Now, listen, China is still the easy button for a lot of people's answers. There's a lot of people who can just use China and make that work. And in some cases, that'll be right. But then you're going to suffer the consequences of um, kind of random supply chain delays, also incredible costs. So maybe if you're just launching a product, you figure out, hey, how can I source that from somewhere near closer um, proximity wise to my target sales market? So maybe you have to spend longer time than you would on Alibaba just finding something simple in China. And you go, well, I need to find something I can ship from Mexico or somewhere sourced in the United States. There's plenty of products in the United States, by the way, or Canada. If, if your U.S. is your main sales market, that North American corridor has uh, a very good trade agreement called the USMCA. Uh, yeah, U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, USMCA which is kind of like NAFTA version two. And it's really good for selling into America and it eliminates all those duties and all those tariffs and all those pain points that also eliminates all the time. So, but it's harder to do it. So it takes a little longer. So you, you have to weigh, should I spend more time up front learning about that? Or should I just hit the easy button, go to China and pay a little extra and take a little longer? These are, that's the critical thinking. You it's, one choice is this and one choice is that, which is better for you. How do you see, it's really interesting that you were saying, how do you see most people will react to that? Would they go for something that it's unknown and learn about it? Or would they just by default go to the easiest way? Well, I could, again, I can make a merit argument for either one. Listen, I, I think honestly, if people have never launched a product, they should just do what's easiest just to get that under their belt. Mm -hmm. uh, I honestly think most people's first product will fail. The, that, that's the truth of it. And but fail doesn't mean that they go out of business or that they, uh, you know, have um, damaged their ability to, to try to do this forever. It just simply means it didn't work as well as they wanted to, but they learned so much along the way. So mm -hmm. I tend to go towards speed, like do what's fastest, easiest, because it's probably not going to be your home run winner lifestyle change on that first decision anyway. So at least learn along the way. And then you get better and smarter. And you can do both of these in parallel, by the way. You can launch something from China really quick and then start investigating alternatives for your next launch as you go. Uh, but again, it, I think context matters because if people come into this and they go, oh, well, I heard this is passive income and I don't have to work and I can just take naps all day and have checks, large checks delivered to me. That's wrong, in my opinion. That's not going to work. It's actually going to be something that you you define your, your advantage competitively by the amount of work and the amount of strategy that you put into it that's different than everybody else. If you just do what everybody else can do, go to Alibaba, stick a label on something and bring it in as a private label, for example, 
That's not differentiated. It's not hard for somebody to knock you off. Uh, the same thing goes for drop shipping or any other thing, right? If you lack strategic advantage, competitive advantage, then it's going to be easy for you to be displaced by someone else who just does it one degree better than you. Mm. I love it. It's like, it resonates with me so much. It's like, feel fast, feel forward somehow, but do it fast, 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 fast. So it's going to be like what I feel. And usually perfectionists, myself included, for that, <laughs> they're going to feel, I cannot fail, I cannot fail. But yeah, definitely, as you were saying, most of the time, I, I feel that people are afraid of failing when, as you were saying, failing, it's, failing is a process, right? And you're learning more by failing than when you're successful. So I definitely agree with what you're saying. So we were talking about the newbie coming, like, who just took the course, they have no experience. Let's go for the... Um, advanced but still medium-sized business amazon seller who already is like producing i mean who is already like five pri private labels in what's your advice for that person in this scenario yeah so now the context is we already have a product or one or more products launched in the market so we have to maintain that supply chain as well as we can which means working with your existing supply chain and just kind of timing out your delays and, and factoring in your increased costs, which probably means, almost certainly means you need to increase your prices. And that's just to maintain what's happening there. Now, simultaneously, I would look at alternative ways to source that. You could source that in other countries, for example, to uh, perhaps at least eliminate uh, duties or tariffs. Uh, you could look at sourcing it out of different material to lower your, your cost basis. You can look at sourcing that closer to home, wherever your target market is, to reduce the time uh, that's tied up. You know, people, so first of all, I want to just tell people, I'm doing that. A lot of sellers do that. We, like, I'm about to leave for India in a, in a week or two, and it's just to source existing products in alternative markets to start eliminating Trump tariffs, uh, some of the variability of pricing, like China has a high degree of volatility right now. It's not exclusive to China, believe me, there's inflation happening everywhere. But China, it seems to be more pronounced. And we, we think that we can find the raw materials in India and then the, the secondary components of manufacturing in India to smooth out some of the edges. And even if we just get the Trump tariff advantage, it's probably a win. We, we're, we're not winning necessarily with the freight because it's still coming from a long ways. Although with India, you could probably send it to the East Coast instead of the West Coast, right, to, to, to move some of that. And a, a little trick for everybody, I use Seattle and Tacoma ports. I never use California ports mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons. But this is right now I win because I bring in everything I come in still is unloaded in a very reasonable amount of time where everybody else is waiting, you know, weeks and weeks. So all of those things. So even if you're just bringing in your current product line, right, that context you just gave me, what about switching it to a different arrival port? What about uh, getting different RFQs? Instead of using the freight forwarder you always use, you get another quote or two or three or five to make sure you're getting the best price and capacity. There's that critical line of thinking, like every little piece of the puzzle should be, you know, can we do this better? What are our options? Can we execute it? Can we afford it? And and by the way, when the answer is no, then just move on. Don't don't go. Oh gosh, I wish we could you know do this and and have a pity party. Just move on and go. Well, can't fix that. What's next? And move right down the line. And that that level of maturity to just be able to treat this as a business problem instead of an an emotional assault on you, right? This is what I think sellers when they treat their their products like it's their baby and oh my gosh you know what this isn't happening and why you know and they just get twisted uh, emotionally about it and i've been there by the way this is not like i somehow flow fly above all this stuff almost every lesson i've learned from doing it the wrong way if you treat this thing like an emotional uh assault on you uh as a seller this is going to not turn out that well for you versus other people who are just like pragmatic this sucks. What do I do about it? This sucks. What do I do about it? And you just go right down the line. That's, it's really not complex, that level of critical thing. It's just like, I see a problem. What are the potential solution and which ones do I like the best? Okay. So the ne next question would have been like, how do you pragmatize yourself? But you just answer to that. Okay. See the problem. How do you solve it? 
at the same time, it's like you were also mentioning something super important, which was like, if it cannot be solved, just move over, like move forward. Like there, which are the most important things that should be solved and which ones should you shouldn't care about? Well, it starts with pure financial decision making, doesn't it? Right. If, if you say, well, the cost of my shipping has quintupled, it's gone up by five times and now I can't sell for a profit. That's what we call a show stopping problem. Right. The, the entire show, the circus, the whatever you want to think of it, it stops now because we can, it doesn't matter how much we sell. We'll never make money. Any show stopping problem, you can't progress. But if it's not a show stopper, you're like, eh, I've got still some margin. And if I raise my price, I have enough margin to be profitable and pay for ads and whatnot. So now I'm, I'm over that shipping increase. I'm going to just raise the price and I'm going to cope with it either by agreeing to lower margins or raising my price. It's no longer a showstopper. So now you're on to the next one. How do I solve this? the time it takes to, for the shipping? Can I improve that in some way? Can I mitigate some of the circumstances I find myself in? Simply switching to port, different ports could help solve that, for example. Why mm -hmm. get in a, a line of 163 ships when you go into other ports that don't have the same problem? I have friends landing stuff in Vancouver, Canada, and then railing it east and then down back into America way faster than going through the Port of Los Angeles uh, complex. And by the way, people don't fully understand this, but not every freight forwarder has the access to all the same routes and ships and so forth. This is why where two years ago we might have used our contracts exclusively with big freight companies. And we're, you know, we're we're shipping and managing somewhere between five and six containers a day, right? So we, we have had, we've relied in the past anyway on contracts and relationships with a couple big freight uh, cargo ship companies. Uh, now, all those are off because those, those guys will go, yeah, you still have the contract. We just won't pick up under that contract. That's their, that's their out for the contract. So my contracted rates are useless. So I have to find alternative resources, many of which have charter space on charter vessels or have access to other lines, maybe through Canada, that your current provider may not. And I know that people, again, they like to hit the easy button. Well, I always call Bob in shipping. He takes care of me. It's like, well, guess what? Today, you need to have five or six people to, to ask what their price is, what's their capacity, what's their route. So time, ability to pick up in the first place, and price, those are the three things that matter free. If you don't have an objective way of comparing that to multiple providers, you're going to get left behind because your competition will do those things and will get a financial benefit. That means they either get more margin if you're selling at the same price or they can sell lower and yield the same, not just margin, but profit dollars, mm -hmm. right? So I, I'm not saying these things to, to you know, be academic about it. I'm saying get smart and think about the, the financial impact of these things without being emotional about it. And I know I'm, I'm lively and I, I tend to uh, get on a tirade about these things. So it may seem I'm emotional, but it, to me, it's just, I want to emphasize the points to sellers. A, you're in control. B, they're just, it's a tr decision tree. Just make decisions and move on with your life and, and don't get your hands ringing and start whining about this or that, what's fair and what's not fair. It doesn't matter. Those, we can all go have a drink somewhere together and cry about we wish things were different or better or easier, or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. We are in the business as entrepreneurs of solving problems. I used to say we solve impossible problems, right? 20 years ago, it was kind of a, thought to be impossible to have some faraway country manufacture something and bring that over and sell it profitably in the United States or Europe or wherever my target market was at the time. And that, that was not only was it not impossible, it became quite pedestrian. Anybody could do it. So now the impossible problem is how can you adjust to this changing supply chain which people perceive as impossible. Well, it's impossible for another country to compete with China. That's what they say, right? That's the instinct. But I guarantee you, it, not only is it possible, we do it. There are things that we can manufacture in the United States cheaper. There are things we can uh, manufacture in Mexico cheaper. And that list will continue to grow as supply chains, raw materials, supply lines, and things like that are all 
kind of built uh, built out over the course of the next, let's say, two or three years. Got it. A follow up there to uh, you were mentioning regarding um, raising prices. I see that, for example, in my category, none of my competitors have done that, and for for now, I I tried raising up prices, and it's not helping. So, what would the play be in this scenario? Well, first, you got to know your competition. So you have to figure out who your competitors are. And I really would try to track your top 10 competitors. And if they're from China, for example, they're slowest to raise price. Mm -hmm. uh, partially because they, they probably have a little better margin than we do. Also because, and again, I say this in a, let's, let me say it carefully. Not everybody who clears products into the United States claims the correct HS codes and pays the correct amounts for duties, tariffs, et cetera. There's, there's games that are played. Where they'll make a bunch of air shipments where they don't have to declare the right stuff and the shipments are unlikely to be inspected. So you have to start thinking about who your competition is and actually are you competing on even ground to begin with? Um, that's, that's relevant because you, you may be more margin sensitive in that uh, particular case. But I will tell you, inventory is what will win Q4 uh, and, and probably into, into Q1 2022. So, you know, if you have inventory, I would definitely try to make sure you're getting margin out of it. And if you, you know, raise your price in low increments, and if you see that dramatically decreasing your sales, then you've got to retreat back to the lower price, assuming you still have a margin. If you don't have a margin, then you need to look for a, a, either an alternative marketplace or another way to bundle to, to take yourself out of that you know, point to point comparison. And I will tell you guys a story very quickly. I had a seller tell me exactly what you just told me. Everybody's selling cheap. I have to sell cheap too. And I said, why? And we argued about it, argued about it. And I'm, I still said, why? I said, why? Until he gave up and said, well, maybe I'll just raise the price a little. So we'll skip to the end. Maybe you raise the price a little bit and then you see what happens. And I'll tell you, in a lot of cases, people are trying to find the premium item. So there's a whole there's a whole segment of shoppers on Amazon, myself included, that look for who is distinctive and who's better. And if everybody is selling this widget for twenty dollars and somebody's selling it for twenty five dollars, automatically there's a, a whole category of buyers who go, "I wonder what that twenty five is all about." Now I'm not denying that low prices can move volume, but if you move volume and you can't restock, what have you won, right? You've won yourself an out-of-stock situation. So, you know, don't forget there's different kinds of customers. Maybe the language, the offering, the uh, maybe even packaging has to be discussed at some point. But selling at the lowest price, even on Amazon, is not always required. And I could give you a number of examples where uh, it's changed. In that particular case of that seller, it not only did he sell at higher prices, other people never really raised the price, and he still was richly rewarded uh, by having higher margin, could then put more money into advertising. E everything gets better when you got cash to do stuff with. When yeah. your cash is like oxygen for a business, if you cut off your own oxygen, you will not find it easy to breathe. Oh, that was deep. <laughs> That is really deep. very, very good one. Here in this scenario, because you were saying, okay, you are going to raise the prices, how much impact do you have? Now we are rabbit holing, but I'm still going to ask, how much impact do you think it's going to have also reviews? Because most of the time, yes, I'm also playing the high end, high price, and I, my product is still uh, going to be bought. But in this scenario, if our competitions have 3,000, 5,000 reviews, and you have maybe just launched the product or maybe a thousand reviews, you know, compared to that. So what's the game there? Because yes, you like executed, you have higher price and now what? Well, listen, so first of all, the question is, are those reviews legit? Yeah, if you have a good competitor yeah. who's got real reviews and they can sell at a cheaper price than you, you're just not doing that good of a job. That's, <laughs> the, that's the way to look at it, right? Because they're either out buying you or they're out thinking you or they're out competing you on some level. So you've like, look inward first and go, are we doing everything we can do? How can they do something cheaper than we can? Everybody is um, subject to the laws of physics, right? And the laws of physics and the laws of economics are closely uh, related. You can't physically make something below a certain price. It doesn't matter who you are. 
The fact, the bigger the factories are, by the way, the costs actually go up, not usually down. So if you go to from a small mom and pop factory who can make a widget for for five dollars, and you go to the big one who does all the bigger major brands, often they charge more than that mom and pop because their overhead's bigger, and they're they're probably using more legit materials. It's on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So first, look inward and really be um, pragmatic. Uh, we in the old days, uh, maybe this will just demonstrate my age and wisdom. Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Yeah. Uh, you know, we do a, a SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T, right? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. And do that on your com competition, right? Where are they better than you? And be, be candid and be thoughtful about it. Be okay to say, yeah, they're kicking my butt right here, right? And then look at where's their weakness? What are they doing that you can exploit? They're definitely doing it to you, right? All of us have competitors who are eager to win, right? And there's an old saying, my partner, uh, Michael Pinkowski would say is somewhere there's competition and they're practicing, right? And when they meet you on the playing field, they're going to beat you if you're not practicing and, and keeping your skills up too, right? And he had a more pithy way to say it, to be honest. But the whole point is if you are not exercising your you know, strategic muscles and, and then doing tactical kind of uh, simulations even, or, or at least investigations, you know, where, like, I always want to win. When, when I go to my factories, I say, hey, why can somebody else sell it at that price? Here's the Amazon fees. Here's my cost. You know, what do they have that I don't have? And, and that will often lead to discussions that say, oh, well, they're, they're clearly not using the same gauge of this, or they're not, you know, you said alloy 75 and they're probably using a cheaper one, right? You, you have to, you have to really get tactical on that front. And then you decide, okay, well, do we do it different, right? To, to bring ourselves down to the competition or do we somehow market ourselves better to point out why we're worth it? Why, you know, we're better. But if the, the, the reviews in the case you gave me are, are legit, they're just they're just winning because they're better. So get better. This is to all the ego and all the everything and the beauty. That is, yes, that's it. We need to get better. That's definitely it. Um, Steve, as we were talking about the three levels, I think now that you were mentioning five, six containers per day, that's already our big sellers, big players. How would they have to look at this China crisis at this point? Well, uh, and it, the difference between level two and three is not that different um, because it's just a, a question of volume. So it's also then a question of resources. So bigger players, um, you know, if you have more resources, then you're going to try to get farther in front of the, the solution or at least the, the contemplated solution, right? I, nobody has a, a crystal ball to really know what the future is, but I believe it's going to get harder in the future to work with China. I believe it'll get less and less economically viable for any number of reasons, which we discussed in Miami in person. But there's also geopolitical risks that, that you know, are increasing uh, with shipping things around the world. So one of the things that we do is we will put what we call boots on the ground, right? We are hiring people in Vietnam and in India and in Mexico just like we have a China team on the ground in China. And so we'll pay more for product development over the next two or three years without expecting any increase in sales. So this means operational costs are going to go up because we want to get in front of what's coming next. And what's coming next is a massive change in supply chain. I know it, it may sound ludicrous to people out there to imagine that you know, China will face stiff competition or China will become less and less viable. But I, that, it's clear that that's going to happen to a lot of people, myself included, that are taking steps to mitigate that future. And so that investment in personnel, which means, you know, product development, and it means, you know, developing supply chain. I was on with one of my folks in India preparing for this trip. And we have a bunch of factories and a bunch of places that we don't yet know. And we have to start the training of those factories. Here's why we're cool. Here's why you should want to do business with us. Here's why when we ask you a question, you should get back to us quickly. Which, by the way, uh, just for those who source in India, is not part of their culture. Mm. Right? They, they don't like to just randomly answer questions. 
they want you to come and sit down and we have a long conversation and blah, 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 right? There's different cultures do things differently. Europe's the same way, by the way. If, if I go to a trade show in Europe, they have, you know, most of their display booth in a trade show is covered up with coffee shops and we're going to sit down and we're going to have coffee and we're going to talk about our kids. University we like and what the sports team is doing. How about the weather, right? Which drives Americans insane, right? Europeans love that. Americans hate it. And so we have to be careful, uh, myself as an American, when I go to cultures that are not built like that, that I want to be as respectful as I can, but I still have to accomplish my mission, right? If I'm only going to be there for 10 days or so, I can't take time to spend a day with a bunch of people, especially because they're far apart. So you have to just, you know, kind of tell your story, right? And you say, here's, here's our background. Here's what we're doing in the future. Here's why we're exciting and we're fun. And you can be part of this fun too, if you give us, you know, high service, low prices and great quality. And so you're selling your manufacturing, right? In the same way you would sell a customer in the same way you would sell somebody to work for you. Everything is about selling. What is the opportunity? What's the bright future? And why should everybody want to jump on board that success train, right? And that's, that's the train that we, we want to drive and, and everybody can get a space on that train and go with us. You are really, really good at CSS. I think I would love to have you back, especially for this, like, because you're really like selling everything. What you're saying is like selling, 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 selling. And then like, I am the loser. Why wouldn't I want to partner up with you? You know, so I love it. I love how you put it, but really it's, it's that way. So here, like, um, how do you go about because you were saying it takes a lot of time, right, to get to meet people yet to find the right people for you. In this scenario, how would you manage a day? What are the most important things that you're looking at? What are the things that you want to make sure that are there? So culturally, you also fit in, like you're also at their level, but it's like you're getting the business. Like you know clearly this is someone I want to work with or not. Well, first of all, we have to focus on the, the largest financial uh, levers in the business. So the, the thing that we're mostly chasing right now is to, to remove the largest dollars of volume that we produce, for example, in China, we need to see if we can have alternative supply lines for that. And by the way, we've already moved some of those to Vietnam, which is, is fine on the tariff side. It's not great on the COVID side. Vietnam remains locked down uh, Zero tolerance is creating plenty of problems in Vietnam. It's not like, oh, now that I move those, I have no problems. There's still plenty of problems in Vietnam, including the high cost of shipping. Um, we've moved 20 containers a month to Germany because uh, at an industrial scale, they can be competitive. And in fact, even cheaper on some products than China. In India, we will now take the next big fat pack of financial impact, you know, 10 plus million in purchases uh, per year. And we will say, here's what we need. So the cultural bridge is, I got a lot of purchasing power that we can deploy to your factory if you cooperate with me. And so that that brings them out of their shell and go, okay, well, let's do business the way that guy wants to do business. Mm -hmm. But I will also try to meet them halfway. I will try for the winners. I will try to go to the dinner with them. I'll try to do lunch with them. I want to spend the time. I actually do want to get to know them on some level. It's just India is a very big country and I have to fly or, you know, all these different places while I'm there to, to learn as much as I can. And all of it is just data gathering. What's the chance of success? And that, by the way, is, is an underused variable in the uh, seller's equation, right? What is the percentage of success chance? We don't, it's not calculable precisely, but when you launch a new product, that product is not a hundred percent chance of success. Mm -hmm. It's not, right? And it's also probably not a 0% chance of success. There's some level in between. But you want to increase that chance of success by having a factory that's going to abide by your specifications, right? Meaning they're going to do the right quality job. And then I'm going to put people on the ground, inspection people of my own or through third parties that will check those inspections, will objective measurements, really precise things, very strict standards, and then we'll even send stuff to labs to check things we can't check with tools or, or by line of sight. So it's, 
it's beyond just the trust. We trust, but verify. Mm -hmm. And then you move into higher levels of success by going, well, what if I had a shipping partner who actually shipped this stuff? Or what if I had a, a marketing partner who wrote good copy for me? You know, what if I had, you know, right? Every single one of these little things increases your chance of success. Uh, if you don't know, for example, how to make a launch, what resource can you go get on, you know, in the Amazon ecosystem to help you make a launch that will get your product ranked? All of these increase that percent chance of success. And you don't need a, a precise number, right? You don't start at 50 and then increase. You just, you just know, does this help my chance of success or not? And, and that should be enough of a, an equation to consider for right now. Yeah, I love that you were saying uh, trust but verify. Most of the time what I see also that um, like on our end, when whenever it's about inspection and so on, sometimes they are like, oh, okay, you're sending in inspection, but should not verify like what we are doing. It's like, what do you mean? Like we are your business partner, like how not, you know? And sometimes I feel like this culture, like for them is like, normal that they would like deliver high quality when for you it's like yes i trust you but still i have to verify you so what's your normal strategy there whenever you see that they are like reluctant even if you know that they're like delivering high quality service well the first thing is anybody who resists that is doing so either out of inconvenience which is less of a factor or out of i don't want you to catch what i'm actually doing um so anybody who's ever produced product in China, if you haven't read the book Poorly Made in China, then you are at a disadvantage. <coughs> Excuse me. Poorly Made in China will tell you exactly how the culture of factory production works there in unbiased and, you know, absolutely uncontroversial ways. It's like, here's our facts. Uh, there's such a thing called quality fade, right? So sometimes you get that first order, everything looks fine. You're, you're tempted to go, ah, they're fine. I've used them before. It's fine. But factories, particularly in the face of inflation, are faced with shrinking margins. It's not just us facing pressure. Factories are getting pressure from the government, getting less and less you know, help from banks and, and access to capital. And then their customers are smashing them over here, right? They're they are literally being crushed against the ground by all of these external forces. So what do they do? They start to go, well, instead of me using this three millimeter thick material, I'm gonna use a 2.8 millimeter thick material. We visually can't tell, right? Unless you're really precise with your measuring uh, instruments and so forth. And and it seems fine. Even a, a shipment goes through and there's no complaints. And the supplier goes, all right, that, that worked out pretty good. And then you start to get some random complaints you didn't have, but you don't know exactly know why they came in. And then the supplier goes, well, nobody said anything about the 2.8 millimeter. Let me try 2.6 millimeters, see what happens, right? And these sound subtle and they sound small, but I guarantee you every, every example in that book has happened to me. By the way, the book's not about me. It's not by me. The author, Paul Midler, brilliant guy, done business in China for decades. He gets it. And when I read that book, it's like a life story. So I know it's true uh, because every one of those situations for the most part, or at least the majority have happened to me. It doesn't matter where you produce. And by the way, this can happen in the US, this can happen in Europe, you know, Australia, China, India, anywhere. But I want you to know that if you as a brand owner are not specifying, which I know a lot of young sellers don't know their specifications yet, but if you're not over time adding on specifications to your purchase orders that say, hey, you know what? Last time we had this issue, right? I said to make them red and some of them came in, they were off shade a little bit. So you have to have a master color sample. You go, all right, now they all have to match this, you know? And then the next thing you go, oh, you know, we had this uh, plastic issue. And so let's get the you know, let's get the mix of the plastic uh, composition correct and make sure you understand, you know, what percent is, you know, poly this and PVC that. And, and, and you really have to start getting more precise about it. And if you don't, that's your business, that's your call, but your competition is more sophisticated. And to be honest with you, the best example I can give you is, you know, China can already outcompete most sellers on, on for any number of reasons, including black hat reasons, which are not awesome. But the big, con the big uh, aggregators, they can outcompete you too, because they'll just do things in a more sophisticated way. All the ways I'm talking about, specifications, drawings, measurements, lab tests, things that we do. I mean, we, 
one of our our instruments that we have in China is a gloss meter. We check what what degree of gloss is on a product. If we specify it needs to be 10 to 15 degrees and it's 20 and our gloss meter says 20, that product's rejected, right? And what happens is the more your factories understand your thorough accounting for quality, the less they try to play games. So this is the same as, you know, if you see cops walking up and down the street, you're less likely to rob the bank. But if you don't see any cops anywhere at any time, you're like, hey, I don't know, I could use a, a little uh, walking around money. And maybe you just, you know, does he knock over the convenience store or whatever, right? And when that works, then you're like, oh, well, I mean, I'll move down the street to the jewelry store and you get that one. You're like, nobody's saying nothing. I'm walking in that bank and I'm taking everything. And this is a human nature situation. I am not picking on any culture. I, I love the Chinese people. I've been there many, many times. I have a, a very close relationship with my team, my many factories there. Uh, I'm saying that humans will do what they want to do. And other humans need to have guardrails to prevent uh, that kind of behavior from being tolerated. And there I was thinking that you've been actually sneaking around and looking into our inspection reports. And no, this is like all over the place. <laughs> Good to know. It's everybody, and it's the it's the lack of supervision that breeds the most problems. I don't know about that, but they're very, very wise. So <laughs> it's like the lack well, of... Well, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. It, we're not above finding stuff in our factories, even to this day, even though we have rigid um, situations. But some of them are showstoppers, and yeah. some are like, all right, you guys got to tighten this up on the next run. We're going to mm -hmm. let it go because we don't think it's going to be a problem. But we want you to know that we notice this variation, and often we'll have tolerance ranges. Um, and but there are some things that we may require that are not again what we call a showstopper, right? It doesn't reject the product. But there are other things that's like, hey, you know, we're, we're we notice what's happening here, make a change, and then if we see it happening consistently, we move farther up the the supply chain for the inspection. We have some times where we will go inspect when the raw materials arrive, right? And make sure that uh, from the, the correct factory, they meet certain environmental specifications because sometimes once you put a component in a product, it's much harder to test. You've mixed materials. But if we're looking for formaldehyde or we're looking for other, you know, VOCs that, you know, come out of a product, we have to go inspect the raw materials and make sure that that is all legit. And there's, there's many ways of doing this, but, it requires more and more kind of uh, boots on the ground, as I said earlier, to manage that if you get a large supply chain. For the time being, third-party logistics or third-party uh, inspection companies are a fine resource as long as you do your job and specify and teach what's most important about your product. You left me like speechless. <laughs> this is the first one. Not <laughs> oh, good, see? I yeah, still have very, value. very good. Of course, of course. And I love the small, sarcastic, sadistic, like small chuckles at the end. Those are, those are really welcome. <laughs> so appreciate yeah, yeah. Well, if you, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. That's my motto. So, Steve, is there anything specific that I should have asked at this point and I haven't regarding this issue that we're facing and how to prevent it or how, how to um, accommodate with it? No, I, you know... I think everybody just needs to first become aware of it and then figure out what impact it will have on them, right? Somebody who's producing, you know, kind of uh, topical, you know, skin stuff in America, they may not think it's going to impact them, but I would start asking questions like, where'd that goop that you put in the jar come from? Because a lot of that goop comes from other places. And they say made in the USA because somebody stuffed it in that, that jar in the USA, but that's actually not how those requirements are made. So be sure you understand literally from the base raw materials, where were they acquired? What steps did they have to go through in pre-production? And then for the final product production, you know, are you managing those? Uh, I don't want to scare people because all of these are problems that are solve, uh, solvable, right? There's no such thing really as an impossible problem. Every problem has a solution. So just go solve it. And I've got an advantage because we've solved a lot of problems over the years. And I have a, a team that really is in that business. But we all learn the same way all you guys do, just by doing it. Maybe getting some experts to help us, maybe get some training, 
uh, as you see it available on a podcast like your own, all of this is valuable. And anybody who's listening to this means you're already a step ahead of the game because at least you're activating your brain. You're not sitting on the sidelines expecting people to send you money for no work. It's mm -hmm. time to work. It's time to get smart and just be better than your competition and admit when they are kicking our trash that it's time for us to raise our own game. Loved it. So a few questions to wrap up uh, and to be respectful of your time. First off, I would ask if you would have a superpower, which one would be and why? Um, I don't know. Let's see. I, I would like to be a, somebody who could fly. And that way I don't have to keep paying these airlines so much money. <laughs> That's a straight on point. Thank you. <laughs> um, what's your favorite dollar or less investment you recently made into understanding better the China crisis and or understanding better China and supply and what what is next to do, basically? Well, I, I read lots of books uh, and I, I listen to lots of information, whether it's on YouTube or the like, and I mm -hmm. filter that pretty heavily. Uh, in other words, just because somebody says something, I start with what's their bias, right? And because you'll hear things on both sides of a, a, a discussion, and I just start with their bias. If they're biased to one side, they're less trustworthy, even if I agree with their ultimate position. I don't trust somebody who just does something because they are in opposition. So somebody who's just anti-China, I'm not going to listen to them because I'm not anti-China. Yeah. I'm just pro-competition, right? And I'm pro profit and I'm pro-capitalism for, for that matter. So we have to just say anybody who's anti-China, I don't take anything they say with, you know, uh, as fact. Uh, I check all of that stuff. And anybody who's like, oh, no, uh, no way China or, you know, the United States or anybody else does anything wrong. Their governments are good, right? I definitely am not going to listen to that nonsense either. So just be, you know, have your your uh, BS, you know, smell detector on. And when you smell it, then you just go, all right, I'm not listening to that. But I am highly, I hate politics and I hate having to follow this stuff. And I'm following it more now than I ever have because the impact to my business and my, the series of uh, the network of businesses we have can be so substantial. And I can't take the risk of having a bunch of my people get, you know, forced out of their jobs because I'm, you know, not doing my job. My job is to kind of predict the future and figure out what's coming. That's what we call setting strategy, right? Anybody who says, well, nobody can predict the future. Everybody's taking a stab at it when you make a strategy. When you launch a product, you're saying, I believe in the future. This product will sell. So you're, everybody's predicting the future on their own basis. So do what you can to educate yourself and, and get a sense, figure out what resonates with you, and then just try, you know, some ideas and go, did this prove my theory or did it disprove my theory and be open. My, my motto is I don't know nothing about nothing. Be open to being wrong. I'm wrong all the time, but rarely in big picture scenarios. Like you might ask me what color is that? And I'll go red and you go, no, that's kind of a fuchsia. I go, all right, well, I was wrong. What do I know? But uh, I'm not wrong about what's coming in the supply chain. I'm not wrong about the realities that we face. I may be wrong about the solutions. My version of the solution may differ from what ultimately works, but I doubt my solutions will fail outright. I think that they will allow us to survive and cope and live to fight another day. That was brilliant. So which are the top favorite books and why? Because we were talking about seeing both sides here also like, what are the books that mostly can help you or can help us that help you? Well, on this topic in particular, I've already mentioned Poorly Made in China uh, mm -hmm. by Paul Midler. He's got a follow-up book called What's Wrong with China that goes into kind of a 150 or 200 year history that, that, that gives some cultural insights to, to level the playing field when you're dealing with the world's best traders, right? And I'm saying traders with a D. They trade products. They're not traitors, but traders, yeah, yeah. right? So they've been trading for thousands of years and as far as I'm concerned, they're the world's best at it, right? So you've got to get better at being a Chinese trader. So those are two books. Uh, there's another one. Um, I just looked back. Uh, Red Roulette is one that I've read um, by a guy named Desmond Shu or something like that. De Desmond Shum. His wife, um, ex-wife, 
anyway, was uh, in prison in China. She's one of the billionaires who got disappeared and reconditioned. That gives you another data point. Uh, it may be at least interesting, if not informative. Uh, I, I have books all over my office. I, I think that's China stuff. If, if you are trying to run a business and you're wondering if you're an entrepreneur, I still recommend the E-Myth. Uh, the current version is called the E-Myth Revisited. Uh, if you uh, believe in systems, I like um, Work the System by Sam Carpenter. Yeah, I could go on. I have read many books. I have three books I haven't read here. Show us what are you going to read. Let's see if I can get it right for you. The Lean Startup, Small Giants, and Profit First. All I've right. read Profit First once, um, but this one is like the Profit First for Amazon sellers. It's like a, a custom version. Oh, oh cool. I didn't know about it. I, I, I think the principles that. are probably largely the same, to be honest with you. And I, by the way, I don't endorse any of the ideas in any of these books. I just think that by accumulating knowledge, you can then make disciplined decision making based on lots of data points. So whether you or not you like a book, uh, it doesn't matter to me. It's just you brought in the data and you made your own decision. Okay. Now, very specific question. What could help us to think as disciplined as you are with whatever you know now so we take all the stiff knowledge and like put it in our brain and become at least this much stiff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll be selling microchips uh, once they get the neural net worked out. Uh, Give me some affiliate mind. for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you know, I, here's what I would tell you. Don't be afraid to be wrong. Like I, I honestly, I, I don't like to be wrong. I don't relish being wrong, but I know I'm a human and I'll be wrong sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think ego is driving a ton of negative things in our society. I think that the fact that the politicians don't want to get blamed for COVID and then the, the things they put in place don't appear to be changing the outcome of COVID, but nobody steps up and goes, you know what? We weren't really right about this. We need to do this instead, or we need to stop doing whatever, right? Nobody ever stands up and goes, you know what? I just simply wasn't right. And there's been plenty of times I am not right. But if you take ego off the table and just don't assume that you are in fact, a superhero. Just assume you're a human and that you make decisions. And by the way, I will tell you, the more decisions you make over the course of your career, the more likely you are to be successful versus trying to make the one right decision that, that wins the day. That's my experience. That's certainly something I practice. I want organizational um, celebration of, you know, we tried it and we failed. Sucks. We wish we didn't you know, fail, but we did. So let's move on and do better next time. Uh, knowing that that institutional knowledge of all those lessons is now equity, right? We didn't really lose per se. We just didn't win yet. And the more times you do that, you are just destined to win. I don't know. Yet again, second time you live without words. So thank you so, so, so much. Like best thing to win. And yeah, all that. It's really whatever everyone listening to this episode right now it's what they need to know because most of the time we are like as, as you were saying so much pushed about the ego about the competition about we have to like be the best and if we fail then we are like you know the the school system mentality you know and i think this is super super helpful and super super welcomed because most of the time you know maybe one like you in this case one one is one people is going to tell you that but a hundred is going to say everything what's wrong about it. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, Steve, it was a pleasure to have you on the show and I certainly hope that you'll be back. Also, you have a lot of things to offer, a lot of knowledge and a lot of wisdom to offer. So thank you so, so much for your time and for um, our listeners and viewers. Thank you so, so much for attending and see you next Sunday. Take care, bye. It was fun sharing this episode with you. If you found value in what you've heard, please show your love with a subscribe rate and review of the show. Until next time.